Welcome to Tap Into TV. I am Brian Brodeur coming to you from East Main Media Studios in Little Falls, New Jersey. This week, we speak to author and health professional William Smith about how to maintain wellness while working from home. And we're joined by John Poveromo, who talks to us about being a stand-up comedian and much more. Entrepreneur Jonathan Kramer tells us about his career path and what it's like running a family business. But first, Stephanie Willoughby checks in with personal chef, Nicole Walker. I'm joined by Nicole Walker, personal chef. Nicole, it's great to have you here. Thank you for having me. What's been going on with you guys? Uh, how is it being a personal chef and also managing your small business during the pandemic? It is very different right now. My business is uh, was based on the idea of a, a private chef cooking in your home, but on a more relaxed basis. So a lot of what my team and I do is we work with families. A lot of times it's families that both parents work, they need to eat a really specific way, they have young kids. So we really went from being in people's homes every single week to now we just can't be in people's homes. Um, so we have been doing a lot of donations. We've been doing a lot of feeding essential workers. Um, we've been putting together things like Zoom classes, and we're currently working on a summer camp program via Zoom. I'm actually surprised that you have that much going on. I, I think that this general idea, at least when it all started, I think everybody kind of had to be like, okay, what's going on? And do I still have a job? And if right. I still have a job, how do I continue to do that job? So how did you come up with some of the ideas that you're having now and kind of keeping your business going? It was definitely a big change. Um, so we are, for safety's sake, for my family, for my clients' families, we chose pretty quickly to stop doing in-home services. Um, the idea of my staff and I being in the grocery stores and being in the public and then being in and out of people's homes, it made me really uncomfortable. Um, and I knew that my clients were also a little bit concerned and it was a struggle because I know that with the grocery store situations, people are really struggling to get food. Um, and so for me, it was trying to make that choice of, do we stay in business? Do we turn to deliveries? Um, or do we just shut down completely? It took a long time to kind of settle on where we were, but as I looked around, I saw that there were so many people who needed to be fed. The hospitals, the nurses, they were all being taken care of, so to speak. Um, as I spoke with more town officials and things like that, we realized that there are so many truly essential workers that aren't being recognized and who aren't being thought about by the bigger organizations. So for example, I fed, lunch for my entire town, the entire town of Bloomfield, all of their essential workers. We fed them a couple of weeks ago. We did box lunches for everybody. It allowed me to keep feeding people, which is my passion, um, keep busy and also do something good. You know, it's so hard sitting in your house all the time and you want to do something. You don't know what you can do. And for me, this is a way to kind of do something. So one of the things that I love about you and the way that you've been able to reinvent your business is that I do think that people forget that essential workers extends to more than our hospital frontline people, which are obviously like critical at this particular point. But there are so many school staffers that are still coming in every day to make sure that homeschool goes well. As you mentioned, there are mechanics, there are delivery people, like the list goes on and on. And I'm so glad that you were able to recognize that the things that you've been doing during this time of that, what will you be carrying forward? We will be carrying forward the feeding people nonprofit side of it. So as I mentioned before, we are in the process of rebranding. We've been so lucky. Um, we've had a lot of success in the last year and a half and we're in the process of rebranding and kind of changing a little bit how we do things. And I'm actually starting a nonprofit arm of my business. Um, working towards uh, the idea that food is a right, not a privilege, and that everybody deserves to have good, clean, wholesome, natural food. And so what we'll be carrying forward from this time is really just that determination that everybody deserves to be fed. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you come from. 
you deserve good, wholesome food, and I want to bring it to you. So that is very, very much the philosophy and the attitude that we are going to be doing taking forward. I love your philosophy. I know that you are one um, part of, of the team of your family that gives so generously to the community there in Bloomfield. Um, and I'm really proud to know you and really proud of the way that you've been able to conduct business and really just fall, like become who you were meant to be during this time. It's really beautiful to watch. It was great speaking with you today, Nicole. Thank you so much. You too. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. What is Tap Into TV? Tap Into TV is the flagship video channel within the Tap Into Hyperlocal News Network. Not only are we producing original video programming, but we're also developing branded content for industries including business and finance, health and wellness, arts and entertainment, and more. The Tap Into Network reaches a dedicated audience of over 8 million subscribers and users, with over 30 million unique page views last year alone. Nearly two-thirds of the Tap Into audience views Tap Into content five to seven times per week, and almost half of that audience bought a product or service because they saw it advertised on Tap Into. Tap Into TV content is automatically distributed to over 40 affiliate websites within the Tap Into network. And not only have we recently launched a dedicated Roku channel, but we produce a weekly half-hour broadcast television show on News 12 Plus, which reaches over three and a half million homes across the tri-state area. We know how to tell your story, and not only can we professionally produce it, but we can effectively broadcast it as well. For more information about how Tap Into TV can help you, visit tapintotv.net or email us at tapintotv at gmail.com. To watch more Tap Into TV videos, subscribe to our YouTube channel at Tap Into TV. I am joined by author and health expert, William Smith. William, thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Appreciate it. Great opportunity. Well, I, I want to get your input and your perspective on people working from home. We're in the middle of a pandemic here. I'm speaking to you in August of 2020. And uh, not only are we looking towards another school semester with lots of people staying home, both students and uh, parents working from home, but we've been going through several months now of, of lots of people having to shift from working out in the world to operating at home. So I'd like your perspective. I know you, you have a lot of information to share. Let, let me know what, uh, what your thoughts are. To set the tone, we have to kind of bucket a remote worker and a te somebody who's telecommuting. Because I think the gig economy has pushed um, remote workers, um, whether it's freelancers, contractors, you have sites like Guru, Upwork, all these different publishing sites um, and creative content sites, Udemy, Teachable. They're supporting a group of people who are usually non-employed contract freelance workers who have been and used to being work, work from a remote setting for many, many years. So this COVID um, situation that we're all in right now may have not had a, uh, as dramatic of an effect upon the way they're living their life. Now, the telecommuters, that's a whole other category. Those are usually employed em employed people. Uh, they are usually exempt for the most part, salaried employees that work at large companies, let's say in the state of New Jersey or abroad. A large percentage of exempt or full-time employees at companies are telecommuting for the first time. And I would just add some statistics to that to support that. Um, again, this trend has been going on for years, but the gig economy coupled with, unfortunately, COVID has pushed this seismic change at a much more rapid rate than anybody could have expected. Um, in 2005, I think there was from to now about 173 173% increase in people working uh, remotely. Um, in 2017, there were about 8 million people working remote consistently in the United States. And I think this latest statistics that I found by 2020, and this is for employed, those who are telecommuting, not the kind of gig remote worker, um, it's going to be about approximately half the U.S. workforce at some point this year, early into next year, that will be telecommuting to some degree. Wow, it's amazing. And thank you for pointing out that difference between a remote worker and telecommuting. 
Tell me a little bit about challenges that people may uh, run into as they're working from home, maybe for the first time. So I, I think there's, <laughs> when it comes to challenges, there's so many challenges. Um, I think the, the initial challenge of working at home, especially for the first time, is your schedule and how you get your mind around that. You get up in the morning, a lot of people are used to, maybe it might be going to the gym, getting your kids breakfast. I'm just thinking about my day, right? And I've seen the challenges such as childcare. By far, that's um, for working families in this day and age with two working parents, by far one of the most difficult things. And I speak personally to that. Um, I think um, another challenge is the schedule. Um, we are not given as many boundaries anymore. I think when the telecommuting idea and now with technology, there's an expectation, whether it's written or informal, that you are available more than maybe what you used to because the common logic is, well, I'm not in the car two hours commuting every day. So I think the boundaries and the childcare are two things that jump out to me right away. Let me drill into that a little further. Um, an area of your expertise specifically would speak to posture and, and physicality or physiology. Can you tell me a little bit about your uh, perspective on that? Well, first and foremost, uh, for, those of, for those people who are working remote for the first time, Okay, telecommuting, undoubtedly, they're not going to have a proper work set up at home. That's, that's just the fact of the matter. Even in office, it's extremely expensive. And I tell you, for large employers, musculoskeletal claims are uh, undoubtedly year after year one of the top spends and one of the top claims uh, right up there with cancer and other types of claims that they go along with um, in, in their insurance plan. So you, you can anticipate like the day is long that there's going to be a spike in musculoskeletal claims within the next year or two. And they're seeing that because number one, COVID has prevented a lot of people from getting the needed preventative care they need. Um, and then that's going to drip over into insurance premiums, which are going to spike and roll over into um, what an employee pays from their healthcare plan. So if there are suggestions I can make um, from that perspective at working at home in terms of posture, it's not sitting, um, set a timer on your computer, for a period of time, that's a great tip. I do that um, every 15 or 20 minutes. I'll stand up, move around a little bit. Um, that's just my trainer brain going off too. Um, I think secondly too, you need to have a proper um, office setup as much as you can. Make sure your chair height is correct. There's a, a small or slight um, flex and extension in your knee. Make sure your hips are slightly above the height of the knees. Make sure your feet are flat in the floor. What about people, you know, working at home, but also we got these devices in our hands. And do you have any input on that too? When you're looking down at a smartphone, the first and foremost, I mean, you shouldn't be looking at that for more than 30 or 45 minutes before bedtime. Um, it's going to keep your brain awake. Oh, that's a good, hold on. That's not a posture detail. Tell me that again, please. Well, in some ways it is because depending on where you're looking at it, right? So if you look at it like this, if you're standing up, but the the tip I just cited was you really should let your brain rest. Your brain is like many other muscles or organs in the body, um, is that it does need to rest. And your optic nerve, which you know connects into your eyes, contributes to about 10 to 15% of your overall balance. So this, this whole thing up here gets really tired, right? And so about 30 to 45 minutes before you go to bed, you shouldn't be staring at your PDA or your smartphone. It will keep you awake. And it will keep you stirring for probably a good hour or two before you actually get into a restful REM sleep. Amazing. Uh, I mean, that's an incredible detail to share. We could talk for hours. Uh, where can people find more information about you and your, your published works and connect with you? So you can find me on Amazon, uh, Exercise for Perfect Posture. I think that's the appropriate theme for today's discussion. Um, you can also find me on Hadley Press's website. They have a wide variety of amazing books. Um, that are great resources. Um, I would add another book to exercise for uh, sciatica, which just came out and is trending very well. Um, I write all my books or co-author them with many doctors and physical therapists. Um, so I recognize where my scope of practice ends, and where another one begins. Um, and I look forward to uh, you know sharing that knowledge with whoever would like to contact me. William Smith, author and health expert. Thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity. As our communities begin to reopen, it's important for businesses of all sizes to let their customers know how they're moving forward, and we're here to help. The Tap Into Network is the nation's fastest growing hyper-local news provider, and Tap Into TV provides unmatched video marketing capabilities. 
Tap Into TV utilizes multiple platforms, including broadcast television, social media, our brand new Roku channel, and don't forget the incredible online search rankings that our content delivers. When you're ready, we're ready. Call or email us today. We'd be happy to help. It's time to get back to business. Well, it is my pleasure to be joined by John Poveromo today. Comedian, actor, writer, cartoonist. John, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me, man. I'm glad to be here. We had a, a good time at the, at the Garden State Film Festival down in Asbury Park. It was, it, was a, it was a crowded room. And of course, with the pandemic, we didn't have that this year. But oh, you, yeah. you know, what I didn't know about you is that you, uh, you have a, a cartooning background. Tell me about that. Uh, I, I, you know what? It's crazy. I, I love to draw. The two things I wanted to be when I was a kid were either a cartoonist or a comedian. So I had no real intention of making any money. Um, but uh, well, join was, uh, join the TV was, business, and you can try that one out. So <laughs> that vest looks pretty expensive. Don't lie to me, man. That's Listen, a Jack Hanna original, isn't this it? This is my weekend work. I, I'm working down at Turtleback Zoo. I gotta, you know, pay the beer money. So oh, I hear you, man. I hear you. Um, but yeah, so I, I wanted to do those two things, and I, I really thought uh, for some reason cartooning would be way more profitable. So I've drawn cartoons for like most of my life, and then stopped for a little bit. And then, um, but once I started doing stand-up and going out on the road regularly, there's not a, you know, a whole lot you could do in a hotel room by yourself. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> well, so, uh, that doesn't get you into trouble, then, you know, and then, you that know. doesn't get me in any trouble. Yeah, exactly. Right, right. And I wound up kind of just, uh, getting back into drawing again hmm. and I would just draw cartoons of either bits that, uh, I thought would work well in cartoon form that I had done on stage or, Ones that maybe didn't work so well uh, in front of an audience, but worked better visually. Um, mm. And then I like, you know, following politics and stuff like that, too. So it, it kind of helps me exercise uh, that level of creativity. I like to have a lot of different tools in my um, in my bag when I'm working with stuff. So I, I, I have to ask the obvious question about influences. I mean, if you're talking about cartooning, mm. you know, um, were you turned on by comics? Was it newspaper you know, comic strips, like what, what was inspirational yeah. in high school, man, big Gary Larson fan, far yes. side, Berkeley yeah. breathes, uh, bloom County. Yeah. Uh, Calvin and Hobbes peanuts and Garfield too. I loved Garfield when I was a kid, you know, it's crazy as I always feel like you find like, like obviously, you know, Garfield's a great, uh, comic strip is one of the most recognized characters ever, but it was kind of like a gateway drug for me as a kid, because it's not like, it's not very political. It's not very heavy handed. Not a lot of satire too, too, but comedically, it's it's a very funny, you know, visual strip. Sure. So I got into that, and it was kind of a gateway drug into like other cartoonists and stuff. And same thing with Peanuts, and then uh, but Gary Larson, Burke breathed uh, for uh, o uh, Opus and Bloom County and stuff, and Calvin and Hobbes are my favorites. Let's focus on your your uh, comedy because you you've certainly uh, traveled around and uh, and you know been mm. paying a lot of dues and getting some notice. Tell me about being on John Fuglesang's show. I was always a huge fan of his too, politically. Like he's he's a great political comic, super funny guy. Yeah. Um, has hosted or been a part of everything, even as a uh, I think he was a VH1, uh, I think he was a VJ for a while, mm -hmm. and uh, I remember even watching him do that when I was a kid too. So now to uh, to be on his show as a panel, I've been on for almost two years now. Wow. Like once a month or twice a month or whatever is huge to me it's still it's still kind of a big deal even though i try not to make it sound like it but in my head most of the time i'm like holy you know i'm on fugle saying show it's crazy and he's uh super smart super fast and he keeps me on my toes and really kind of helps me sharpen like when i go on there i have to be prepared so uh -huh. it it makes you makes you really really i mean i'm pretty pretty politically aware and active and if you've seen my facebook page lately but uh it's obnoxious uh, but um <laughs> but it helps yeah. it helps when i'm on shows like that because i you just you have to be fast when you're on with him i want you to give me a big download about uh what you're doing with your comedy now obviously pandemic has affected this playing rooms live and such but uh give me a yeah. little history please and then uh, tell me what the future looks like yeah so i i mean what i'm not doing um i'm not, i'm not going out doing shows or anything like that i don't i don't plan on having a uh a spread the virus tour 
or anything like that, like most of these guys are doing. Yeah. Um, I've done, I've been doing a lot of uh, podcasts, a lot of interviews, a lot of stuff. I'm, I'm actually going to be doing my own podcast soon. It'll be on Monday nights and Thursday nights called Dystopia Tonight. Uh, Perfect. And it will kind of cover everything that we fear, um, I think, or whatever. <laughs> and, and just this stuff. It'll just be a lot of talking. Another guy just talking to a camera. Um, but I haven't done any Zoom shows yet. I don't want to do stand-up um without an audience the way i think it should be done so yeah. for right now i'm focusing on uh writing um doing interviews podcasts stuff like that drawing and and uh, i have other projects going on this is great having you on and uh I'm, I'm thrilled you took time to join us thanks for having me man i enjoyed it a lot great to see you take care john you too man bye-bye Tap Into is a network of more than 80 franchise local news sites with more than 10 million readers. Bring local news to your community while owning your own business. Tap Into provides you with the training, support, and technology to help you build a profitable business. To find out more, visit www.starttap.net. I am joined today by Jonathan Kramer of Progressive Payment Solutions and Progressive Capital Resources. Jonathan, thanks for joining me. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Now, listen, we're going to talk about your businesses and a couple other topics, but I want to hear a little bit about, uh, as a young man, you took to the high seas and, and joined the Merchant Marine and, and sailed on some large vessels, and there's some great stories there. I want to hear a little bit about that. You grow up very quickly out there, that's for sure. I mean, I'm a young 15-year-old kid working on you know, freighters and oil tankers and yeah. uh, doing adult work. It wasn't like a summer job where you're, you know, I mean, yeah. they relied on you to, to work. It was, it was real work and it was hard work. It was manual labor and hard work. So um, you grow up very, very quickly out there. You learn how to survive in the world and hmm. uh, make money. It was also a fantastic experience. I traveled to Russia, Germany, Belgium, Holland, Sweden, all over South America, North America. Wow. Uh, I was pretty well traveled by the time uh, I was 18. Fascinating stuff. I, I mean, you know, it, it uh, never mind being a, a young man a young teenager and, and having that experience, but just the act of being out at the high seas, most people don't do that. I mean, uh, yeah, I yeah. would say most people don't do that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> their version of that is taking a cruise. And that's <laughs> yeah. not what you did. Yeah. No, yeah. that, that wasn't what I did. So let's talk about your two companies, progressive payment solutions and progressive capital resources, right? Yes. Can you tell me briefly about each of those businesses? Go ahead. So Progressive Payment Solutions is a credit card processing company, and we've been around for approximately 15 or 16 years. And um, it's been an interesting ride uh, for the most part. Uh, but right now, it's a very exciting time in the credit card processing business, if there is such a thing as an exciting time in the credit card processing business, because um, now gives the uh, business owner an opportunity to save quite a bit of money. And when I mean by quite a bit of money, a uh, business owner can now save up to 100% of their credit card processing costs um, by a, uh, a, pro a pricing uh, platform called cash discounting. Basically what that does is the business owner uh, can pass the credit card processing fees along to their customer in a legally and federally compliant manner. Uh, there are a couple of caveats to that. Uh, number one being that uh, you have to have full disclosure uh, to your customer. And number two, uh, you have to use federally compliant equipment or software. Right, now these are two very important points. Yes. You cannot, as a business, decide on your own to add a fee. And where the legality comes in is you are not allowed to profit on that fee. So um, we do it uh, on your behalf or on the business's behalf. And that's clean and clear and uh, leaves no room for speculation on the customer side or the, the retailer side. That's correct. You're handling that. Clearly. So now let's bridge it to your other side of the world here mm -hmm. with your with PCR, right? Progressive right. Capital Resources. Right. Tell me about that line of work and how you're connecting it to progressive payments. Sure. 
Progressive uh, Capital Resources was actually born out of Progressive Payment Solutions. As we got into the business, we were getting requests not for small amounts of money. We were getting requests for quite significant amounts of money. But to be clear, that business is really for businesses that cannot go to a bank. If, a, if you have a business that is bankable, then we're not the ones you want to speak to. Well, listen, what's bankable is, has been a question over the years, especially after mm -hmm. the Great Recession. Sure. And certainly we'll see what the fallout of the pandemic will be from the financial sector side. Yes. So you're probably positioned in a, in a good place. So please continue. So non-bankable businesses? Non-bankable non businesses or businesses that need a facility uh, over and above what a bank may offer them. And uh, what we've done is we've gone out and we have formed relationships with various types of lenders, any type of lender that you could possibly think of. Uh, and when a business comes to us, we would sit down with them, discuss you know, what their needs are, how much they need, when they need it, what they're gonna use the money for. And then we go to market and leverage our uh, relationships and hopefully bring not only one opportunity to the table, but multiple opportunities to the table for a business to get the capital they need to grow. I'm gonna shift gears. I'm interested in your uh, work with your family members in the business. Your two sons work with you in these two companies. Yes. Tell me what, what that's like, uh, both the challenges and the positives. Tell me about that. It's uh, probably um, a little bit more difficult to be a boss <laughs> slash dad. I mean, sure. it's hard to kind of make that distinction at times. Sure. And most of the time I cave and I'm dad. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I'll be honest with you. <laughs> but, um, you know, as I said, I mean, things have been going pretty well so far. And yeah. um, look, they've only been with me for a couple of years, two and three years, respectfully, between the, you know, the two of them. Yeah. And it takes a while to build a foundation. But they've been um, very, very productive. Uh, they've learned a lot. And uh, they uh, have absolutely become master networkers. I had them networking with me professionally since they've been about 15 years old. I would bring them to networking meetings, uh, ABA in particular, and I introduced them to networking and learning how to leverage their relationships. Well, perfect segue. Let's speak about ABA. You're a member of the American Business Associates Business Development Group. Tell me about that group and, and what business networking and, and development means for you. Sure. Uh, I've actually been a member of uh, ABA probably for 16 years. I think wow. I, think I joined uh, just before I actually got into the credit card processing business. Mm -hmm. Although I probably have been networking my whole life, um, I'd never networked professionally before, and this uh, gave me a very strong venue to network professionally, leverage relationships, and build business. And um, ABA has been a very, very viable uh, networking organization for me uh, throughout um, the time I've been in the credit card processing business and the uh, alternative lending business, and it's been a huge uh, help in developing business. Um, very, very important to me. You know, look, you have a fascinating background. Uh, oh, thank you. You know, from your current businesses to, uh, to your young years at sea, it's really yeah. interesting. And thanks for coming in today to the studio and, and telling us uh, more about what you do. Thank you very much, Brian. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. To watch more Tap Into TV, follow us on social media at Tap Into TV. Hey, tune in next week for another episode of Tap Into TV. Don't forget to follow us on social media, and you can watch any of our videos at tapintotv.net. Thanks for watching. Stay safe and healthy. See you next week. Hi, Fred. How's the old golf game? Uh, don't ask. 
Six inches of snow and a blizzard on the way. What do you got in mind? Yeah. Oh, how about some golf at Pebble Beach Saturday afternoon? Great. Anything to get out of here. When you're ready, Lepley's ready. All right, here's what we'll do. We'll meet at the El Centro about noon, have some lunch, and then we'll tee off. Andrew Lepley, how'd we do today? Oh, we nailed it. We nailed it.